Welcome, Michael and Phil. I'm happy to have you on this webinar. I'm an SPC, part of the I'm an SPC um, series, I think, that Phil, you've been hosting, which has been fantastic. Um, I just wanted to welcome everybody. We have a lot of people kind of clicking in, so we'll give people another minute or two to get on board. And while we're doing that, everyone knows we're recording, but I think the key thing is we'll also be sharing the recording um, within about a 24 hour period. It takes us to uh, process all this, but within a day, we'll be sharing the recording, the link to the recording, and then also any other um, resources or ideas or things that might come up at the end of this that we want to attach to that kind of follow-up email. So we'll try to make it full of useful information and also the links that people will need. All right, a couple more minutes here, or maybe one more minute. Hmm. And Laura, um, should this link work for Charles without, because it's still asking him to sign in? Uh, it. Let's try it. It should. If it doesn't, just have him join the normal. Actually, one. if he joins the normal way, I can promote him to be a panelist. Okay, what's the normal way? Uh, um, if you just copy the link out of the bottom where it says participants. Oh, actually, it's not there. Sorry, folks, we're having a little bit of a. Uh... Could you slack it to me, please? That's the register. It looks like he's going to have to register, Laura. Uh... <laughs> I'm not sure how to solve this problem super quickly. Let's see. Um... Oh, Charles is on now. Oh, he is. There he is. All right. I am promoting him right now. Awesome. Yay. Allowed to talk? Hey there, Charles. You should be able to turn on your um, audio and video. All right, I think we can hear you now. Charles, can you say hi to us and see if we can hear you? I've made it. How are you awesome. doing? Um, yay, hey. Charles, thank you so much. Do you have um, the ability to turn on video as well? I'm trying, says my video, can I start doing a video because the host has not, has stopped it. The host has stopped so, it. Let me see if I can fix that. I must be empowered. <laughs> that mm. is so bizarre. I don't see. Um, I was, you want to make him a co-host, Laura? I don't know how to do that. Try your video now. Charlie. There we go. Whatever you done. All right. Yeah, there you go. There you All go. right, everybody. How about thank, that? You for, <laughs> thank you for holding oh. tight. You know, life is never dull. So, Charles, thank you so much for joining. I'm excited that you're here, first of all, because I finally get to meet you. Um, I, I don't think we have talked one-on-one uh, -on -one in person before. So, welcome. Um, and you're still muted. I know. There we go. I know. I, I do a little bit of wiggling, so I thought that uh, you'd prefer not to hear it in the background. <laughs> nice to put a face with the name as well. All right. Well, um, I'm going to turn this over to Phil and Michael, because I, I think your story about um, the um, business agility journey that you've taken along with um, a big portion of your company is super interesting. So I don't want to take any more time other than that. So Phil and Michael, I'll turn it over to you two and, and love to hear the story. Okay. So just to just to frame this up, right? Our, our This talk today is one in a, in a series. We're doing monthly. Um, if you've noticed, we're each. if you've attended previous ones, each month we're having less and less slides. Um, and it's kind of because it's really about the stories and about the people as opposed to um, the presentations. And so today, this is really talking about I'm an SPC and I'm a consultant. So, you know, unlike last time we talked about coaching, we're talking about consultants where hey, we need you to do something, right? Don't ask me what you think. 
Uh, don't ask me what I think 47 times. Actually, we need to get some stuff done. All right. It's going to be kind of a, a talk show format in that most of the talking will be Charles and, and Mike. And so when we think about this, you know, let's, let's just start with that topic, right? You know, any thoughts on, on what is a consultant and, and how it differs from a coach? Mike, do you have some thoughts on that? And Charles? Yeah, this is an interesting one. So, um, you know, there, there's this big gray area between being a, a coach and a consultant. And of course, uh, a coach really is all about helping someone, enabling someone on their own journey, those goals that they have, helping them realize those goals um, as they see them not this is not about your point of view this is about their point of view and and so you're enabling that journey um some of the things that come to mind uh, you know your your training your mentoring your facilitating those are the kinds of things you do when when you're coaching consulting is very different right consulting is the idea you're more direct with your efforts to guide the overall goal you've sat down with the client you you've aligned on what the goals are but you're taking a more active direct role because now you're bringing um, your experience, your knowledge and skills to the, to the fore to help them deliver um, and to hit those objectives and, and goals for the engagement. Um, quite often you, in reality, you end up switching back and forth between those modes, sometimes in the same meeting, right, Charles? And um, there are times when um, you're, you're in that coach mode where you're trying to help them um, on their learning journey. And sometimes you're stepping back and you're being a little more direct um, and trying to move them towards the outcomes from your point of view. And, and just really quick here, um, you know, Mike Robertson's an SPC, SPC here at Applied Frameworks. Charles is actually um, one, of, uh, one of the customers that he worked with. And I thought that it might be interesting to get a perspective from, um, from the person who would hire a consultant as opposed to just the consultant themselves. And so, you know, um, Charles, when you think about this as a, as a as a leader, did you experience Mike switching back and forth? Did you see a difference in, in this is a great question. Yeah. But I but I saw I saw an extremely multifaceted Mike as well, right? So, you know, I was listening um astutely as Mike was kind of providing his response and drawing the distinction between uh between the two roles. To me, uh this might be letting me off the Budweiser hot seat a little too easily. But um, I never saw Mike in any particular capacity. To me, Mike was a trusted partner. You know, I never, he was never once referred to as Mike, the, you know, the coach or Mike, you know, the contractor or Mike, the consultant or Mike, you know, the safe expert. Um, he was, he was always referred to uh, by us as Mike. Um, you know, we incorporated him, we immersed him, he sat on my leadership team, whether it was relative to us talking specifically or myopically about SAFE or other, other dynamics so, such as, you know, cultural uh, ongoings, team structure, um, delivery challenges, just getting a feel of, you know, at the organic level, what we were going through, Mike was just one of us, he was an extension of our team. And so as I was listening to Mike talk about it, you know, from a commercial slash, you know, Webster, Oxford, whichever type guy you are, dictionary, um, to me, he transcended um, uh, those those two particular terms. You know, at times he, um, he was coaching, he was consultative, uh, he was strong at partnering, uh, he was mentoring me, he was encouraging me, he was challenging me. Um, so, you know, I don't know, you know, how you slot those into those two particular buckets. But when I look at this at the spectrum of what he brought to me, uh, I, I think it would be reducing the value that I saw in him by say by contrasting a, a, a consultant versus uh, um, a coach. He was he was so much more than that. Fair enough. Any, you know. Any advice that you would give people who are looking for a consultant, for a coach? You know, I, obviously, Mike, 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 and you had a strong partnership. But taking, you know, thinking about our audience here who may be listening, some of them are going to be hiring SPCs. Some of them may be SPCs that are earlier on their journey. Um, we might have some agile coaches. We might have some some. We may even have a certified Scrum trainer listening yeah. in. Right? What 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 advice or, or thoughts would you give for somebody trying to help with with a transformation as a partner? 
Yeah, let me dissect this because again, you know, oftentimes when there's the simplicity of something, you know, on one end, there's the complexity of it on the back end, right? It's easy to slide your finger up and down a piece of glass with a virtual keyboard, but on the back end, you know, it's super, super complex to deliver that simplicity. So um, from my perspective, I think what is really important is that you do truly need to have somebody who understands the framework uh, of which you're trying to kind of compete, or excuse me, um, transition to or whatever task it is that you're trying to complete. Um, that person does need to be extremely proficient in that skill set. They need to understand that paradigm extremely well. After all, you are pursuing them for that very, very specific um, skill set. Um, but in an organization the size of ours, $50, $60 billion market cap, you have an IT organization of five to 10,000 people, annual revenues of you know, $20 billion. Um, what what is framed academically, and I don't mean that to, to be obtuse or in a pedantic way, but what is framed, um, you know, academically needs to, needs to be understood to the extent to when it is brought into an organization, the individual with whom you're partnering up with understands how to make that malleable so that that framework starts to bend, adopt, and incorporate the realities of your day to day. It's nice to look at things from a certification perspective or a book, but when the rubber hits the road, you need somebody that understands the puts and takes, the gives and gets, because you're going to need to flex that framework, so to speak. And Mike was very good at understanding the guardrails. Oh, we can give you a little bit of this one, Charles, on your mission, but if this is really the outcome, you got to hold the forward on this one, right? So there were some puts and takes. So I would say, first and foremost, somebody, somebody's um, acumen relative to this domain has to be profoundly strong. But I think that there was a lot of ancillary benefit. You know, um, when we spoke to Mike, he had an understanding of the life sciences arena. Mike also had a commercial acumen about it. Mike also understood um, some of the other corporate dynamics. You know, how do you um, market this? right to your senior leadership team. You've got to have the backing of presidents, the SVPs, the, the VPs. Um, what are some of the cultural dynamics that are in there? Am I, am I sensing resistance in that team? Is it right that what, what, what I'm feeling? You know, are you prepared to change not only the structure um, from a delivery model, what it is that you're doing, but are you prepared to change the physical team structure of the resources where they reside, right? There were so many of these um, uh, these paradigms that existed outside of a true, you know, let's just talk safe, um, that I would implore any individual um, to pressure test with those with whom they intend to do business with, because that's the framework. But you, if you were to think about it as a flower, that's the center of the sunflower, right? All around it, you've got all these different petals that have to feed into that. And I, I would advocate to folk, don't just look at the center of it, but pull the pedals um, as well to make sure that you know that they're holding weight. So I would look more broadly than just a framework. I would be looking at industry experience, professional experience, executive presence. Have they done things around cultural change, conflict management? So there's a myriad of things I would that I would entice people to investigate. And what I'm hearing you say is, is definitely need to be an expert in SAFE, but you need to be more than that, you know, and, and you know, I'm going to flash up here really quickly. This, this, um, you know, this is our current version of this kind of uh, SPC self-assessment, right? The, the different areas that you need to, you know, as an SPC, you may want to explore. What I heard Charles talking a lot about in there was the leadership skills, right? That self-awareness, social awareness, um, empathy, authenticity, but also um, I heard him talk about you know, the industry experience and the understanding and having some of that specialization, right? Having a background that allowed them to connect with Charles and, and, and their organization when it came to the type of work they did, the type of industry they were in. Um, and I, I, I don't want to have a lot of slides up here. Um, Mike, anything you'd, you'd like to add to that as, as far as kind of, you know, the, the, role of, the role of an SPC? I know that you and I joke about um, you know, um, is it your, is it, is it, did you lead the transformation or did Charles? And just the side note here, um, if you go to my resume, you will not see me listing where I've led a transformation. There was one I led and that was at AT&T when I was an employee there, but as an outside person, um, you know, 
I believe that it's it's your transformation and we're there to support you. Um, Mike, do you have do you have thoughts on that? Well, um, you know, certainly you have to understand, first of all, that this is definitely the client's transformation, right? It's their problem you're trying to solve. Um, it's it's not your opportunity to have fame and fortune. It's it's an opportunity to help them solve a problem and for them to be successful. This is they're paying you to come in and help them solve their problem. Um, so, you know, part of what we're trying to do is enable long-term sustainable success, right? And, and that's working with their internal team and understanding what are the dynamics there? Where can you lean on folks? Where do you have to spend time training and coaching to bring folks up to speed? But in the end, you want to hand that off um, to the client so that you can go off in the sunset and they can keep moving towards relentless improvement and long-term sustainability and profitability, right? That's really what we're after. Um, so, you know, I think the goal is have that in mind. Don't sweat the small stuff, make changes where you need to, to and be flexible, but always keep their objectives in mind and, and uh, make it their success and it'll be yours in the end. Excellent. So, um, you know, as we're going through this, you know, the, 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 I really want to pull the thread around, um, you know, what, what our attendees can listen, what can, can learn from, from both of you together, um, because you represent a, you know, sustainable success, that profit, that sustainable profitability comes from great partnerships. And, um, you know, Mike, I know one of the things you and I talked about previously, um, this idea of kind of doing more than just checking the boxes, right? Meeting the client, um, where they are on their terms. And I heard Charles say a little bit about that in kind of flexing the framework. Um, is that something that you found as a challenge as a consultant, um, knowing when to push back, Mike? Um, of course it is, right? And, and the, the first thing you have to establish is that level of trust so that you can have those, those conversations and get to a good place. Um, it really, again, Charles nailed it, right? It's really about partnership. It's about understanding their challenges um, and making sure that you've got that in mind and you're helping them move towards it. And you're not focused on this checklist of items that you're trying to get through. You're focused on, you know, what are the challenges that they're facing and, and how do you focus on those? So, um, you know, it's being that steadfast partner is, is really the key. Um, and in, in the end, you have to have the right mindset to, to make it about them and not about you. And, <laughs> And of course, experience helps um, to navigate those conversations. You know, Charles, anything you'd, you'd want to think about there? Any, any advice or, you know, are there times when maybe Mike pushed too hard or didn't push too hard enough? I know I met you on your journey and uh, you, and I, you and I didn't click immediately, right? Yeah, we didn't, but and, it was for the right reasons, right? And, you know, Mike, Mike can probably attest, I, I'm unorthodox in how I think, right? Like some people say, you know, don't start fires, but under the right conditions, you know, igniting a fire is good, right? We we have controlled burns because it rototills the soil and prepares it, you know, for a better harvest next year. And so I think Mike and I did a really good job of fighting the war on uh, traditional thinking and convention conventional wisdoms. But Phil, you're right. And in, you know, full transparency, this is why I was so, um, I, I guess, strong in my convictions about some of the attributes that I threw up on the table that were important for Mike to have. They were equally as important to me. Um, and Phil, you are right in full transparency, right? I mean, we had, um, we, we had a very powerful exchange and then Mike and I had a very powerful exchange, but we could not have um, engaged in that level of, of transparency um, where our emotions were there, right? I mean, it's easy to get swept away in a transformation of this and that, but like these are real people, real lives, you're shifting real mindsets, you're making real impact. There's anxiety, there's trepidation. Are we getting it right? And you gotta have this trusted partnership that is so symbiotic that when we're pushing on each other the way that we did, the one thing that we also had was a willingness to acquiesce to logic and reason, yep. right? We gave way to each other. And sometimes I was, sometimes I was in the, in the seat of, you know, kind of being driven. 
And then sometimes, you know, you were in the seat of being driven. Now, give, take was all, it always had an equilibrium um, there. And so, you know, as I was listening to my talk, those are the things that, you know, are really kind of jumping out in the back of my mind. But I was also sitting there thinking about it, 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 it was, it's more to me than just meeting the client at the center of where their needs are at that particular point in time. We keep saying trusted partner, but it is the bedrock of what is, of, of what is required to move forward. Because you're going to be caustic. And I'll give you an example of like what I mean about why the trusted partner is so important in meeting folks on their journey. I think Mike did a tremendous job of like meeting us at the center of where we existed at that point in time. But I think we also thought that we were we were more educated, more edified, and more proficient in kind of moving ourselves forward than what we were. And this was a point of contention for internal resources. And it was only the ability for, for us to kind of amalgamate like everyone's agendas and consolidate them into one and to create the vision, the future state vision together. The meeting the individual there is easy. I see you standing on the corner, hey, how you doing? It's the grabbing the hand, the looking both ways across the street and taking the journey together. And the definition of that is hard because now you're in a relationship. Before you're, you know, the, the dynamics of the relationship is, hey, I'm in this role and I'm demanding this. When 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 you grab hands with somebody and you have a, a, a level of of, uh, of symbiosis that exists between you two, you are now in a partnership. You're now in a real relationship, and in a real relationship, you know, you're where each one of you is wearing the pants at a different time. So I think it's it's also about you know committing with strong convictions about grabbing hands creating a vision and seeing that vision to the outcome. And I think that's why Mike was also starting to become lost in translation to us. And we never saw a consultant or a coach. We saw a member of our team that's trying to get the ball, you know, in the end zone, so to speak. And, and we all tried to play that, that role as best as we possibly could. So I, I know that there was a lot of color context in there, but I think that, that, that the question that you raised there is probably one of the most important that you've raised to to date, and so I wanted to elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, and and the, I appreciate that. And this is, you know, it's like, do I say that we didn't agree, right? Yes, because we didn't agree, right? The reality is, change is hard, and um, you know, part of my role is oftentimes in more of a strategic advisory role. And if Mike couldn't build that relationship with you, um, you wouldn't get the value from him as a consultant, um, and he wouldn't be able to do his job. And sometimes, um, you know demonstrating vulnerability, demonstrating patience and openness, um, allow you to work through conflict. And then you end up now you're empowered, you know, look, we're going to continue to do this. And that becomes that sets the tone um, for the, you know, for the transformation and for the way that people work. And so yeah. it was, it was, um, it, it was, it was pretty interesting to, to see how that went, you know, and Mike, you were there kind of, um, you know, you, you've heard what, what, what uh, Charles has shared about, you know, his, his, his time with you and everything. Um, is there anything that you think that you you might have done differently to kind of help prepare the client, prepare Charles and team for 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 the changes that were coming, to prepare them for that 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 sustainable profitability and for the new way of working? Well, you know that's always um, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But um, I I think what the key for us was to remain dynamic. Um, and to keep the line of communications open. Um, all through the challenges that we had, and, and there were many, um, to initially get this, this some traction here, you know, Charles was very transparent with me about um, his needs and his situation, personal and professional. Yeah. Um, and, and we had those very deep conversations, and I, and I was very forthright with him as well, uh, you know, what was going on in my head. And um, th the idea that, you know, we, we couldn't have made it past square one if we didn't establish that first, right? After we did, it was pretty awesome uh, because we started, we started to act as a team and not as a group of individuals on a team, if that makes sense. We, we started, we, we had some rhythm together and that was pretty cool because now we were more in tune with each other, in step with each other, and we were more consistent with the messaging that we were delivering out to um, the rest of the team, which uh, to me was critical. Mm -hmm. 
looking back on it, really what we were doing was we were focusing on the values and principles, right? Mm -hmm. We were gaining alignment. We were building trust. Um, we were uh, being transparent. Those things were really, Charles, to me, those were the things that got us through the rough times um, so that we could make it um, to the good times. That, to me, was the key. Yeah, it wasn't easy, Mike, and, and, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, boy, as I was listening to you talk, I, I just, I, I really kind of got touched a little emotional because it was hard. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't, you know, it was, neither one of us walked into this kind of with the Maytag man's, you know, job, so to speak, where, the, you know, it never breaks down. All you got to do is grab a newspaper and figure out new ways to, you know, uh, spend, spend the hours of your days. It was a lot of pressure. Um, there was millions of dollars being spent. There was a lot of ambiguity in the delivery that the team that I had recently inherited was up against. Um, you know, I started reporting to a new president with a very insatiable appetite that wanted to see some pretty significant changes with some pretty, you know, significant celerity. And so, you know, even under the best of circumstances, this change is, is challenging. It's formidable. Certainly uh, not uh, insurmountable, um, but to throw in some of the dynamics that many of, of the listeners may be hearing today, oftentimes what's kind of catalyzing you and moving you, you know, uh, through this change um, is that things could be going better. Things could be more efficient. Quality could be improved. And so now you layer in those dynamics as well, um, and the pressure to deliver becomes enormous. And so, you know, to Mike's point, without first establishing that relationship and making sure that that thing is fortified, it's almost impossible to, 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 to move it forward because you'll be dealing with a lot of external dynamics on your way to put in the framework. So that's what I would kind of add to that, to that question, Bill. It was a great question. Thank you. I'm, I'm just thinking about this a little bit, um, you know, Mike, um, thinking about some of the common challenges that, that, that occur one of them is, as a consultant, what do you actually say you're going to deliver, um, right? So um, what, what was the expectation, and, and whether Mike or, or Charles want to answer this, the expectations of the services provided by the consultant, right? And did you stick to that? You know, did, you, did, you, did it become um, wider and deeper, right? What, were, what, what did you tell Charles he was going to get from, from following um, some of your advice along this journey? Was it productivity, well, pro productivity, you know, time to yes. market, customer satisfaction? Right. So this is an interesting one. Um, we, we, of course, always start with a statement of work with the, the client, right? And, and um, those typically quickly go out the window when you realize that they were perhaps scratching the surface and that the real challenges lay underneath and that you were going to uncover those as your engagement went forward. Um, that, so there was a little bit of that, and, and uh, uh, Charles was put in a really tough position because he came in a couple of months after we had started this transformation and was really kind of on the spot to uh, turn this around and, and, and uh, make it um, everything that everybody wanted it to be. But really, to set the expectation, Charles and I just sat down and, and talked about what he wanted out of this. What did the team need? Um, and, you know, being agile, we, we uh, continually modified what, what the direction was um, and eventually got to the happy place. This, in the end, it came about meeting them where they are and finding out what, you know, relentless improvement looked like for these folks and just executing on that and then just, you know, iterating through that, that understanding what the challenges were and what the next priority was. What uh, what what was the happy place? Where where did you where did you where did you get to together, Charles? Oh man, again, you know th these are these are tough questions to to respond to, but um, ultimately, and Mike is right. I think he did a really good job of kind of teasing out some of the ambiguity in the needs too. Right, like you think you know what you need until you're in it, and you're like, oh my gosh. I never even knew this existed. Oh my God, I never even thought about this. Like, oh my God, you know, I see this safe framework and this agile framework and this is incredible, but we're so matrixed in, in this company where we got 52 
different managers that all my you know, people in my product stack are reporting to. And man, we got to, you know, redo structure. So there was a lot of that in the beginning. You know, it probably took us about maybe 30, 30 days or so and a lot of time to kind of gain the equilibrium on what my expectations were. And honestly, I was really just asking for a framework within which we could execute our work in a way that brought clarity, that brought predictability, that brought um, accountability, um, that brought speed, um, because we were challenged with these things. What are we delivering? Who asked for what? Where are we? What is the barometer for success? You know, there was just all this fluidity in our delivery model. And really what I was asking Mike for was to help um, transition me and the team to a place to where delivery was not dominating our entire day uh, insofar as creating a consequence where we cannot devote necessary time to developing strategies and uncovering new revenue generating opportunities, you know, via our tech or optimizing our business because everything is about delivery, delivery, delivery. And I was asking him to partner very closely with me on a professional level to fix that piece because until I fix that piece, you know, I'm managing a product stack of, you know, 20 plus million just for one product stack and put it, put it across several, right? It's a lot of money moving, a lot of parts moving, hundreds of people with no framework, no guardrail. What is success? Are we winning? Are we losing? Who the hell knows? So, you know, my ask to Mike was, can we construct a framework that allows us to improve in our delivery area so that we can grow in other areas? And we did do that. I mean, you know, our first, we had anticipated or we had a target of trying to deliver 80% of what we committed to in a program increment. And we're going to run four a year. Our goal was to, by the end of 12 months, to be able to hit 80% of what we committed to. Our first program increment, probably four months, Mike, after we started the exercise, four or five months after, we, we moved fast and hard, I'll, I'll admit. But um, we, brought in, we brought in the Calvary. But um, I would say after our first program increment, I believe we hit 72% out of the gates. And that was, that um, was an improvement for you. Oh, gosh. We, not only was it an improvement, I would love to tell you what our strike rate was before SAFE, but the framework was was so um, hysteria riddled and so convoluted. I can't even tell you what that basic benchmark would have been. You know, things were getting done, things weren't getting done. But, you know, when you look at an overall percentage of delivery, you, you couldn't really tell. Um, so, again, so we kind of started that was our benchmark. We've had three program increments since then. We've never been below 92% of, of, of what we've committed to. So within our second program increment, we were hitting that 80%. And, you know, those are some of the ancillary things that when you I reflect back to your question about what would you, what would you look for in a partner? You know, Mike, Mike was there for our organization in a way to where I went to Mike and said, Mike, I would love for you to, to make sure that you're around for our first program increment delivery. And he said to me, I would have it no other way. And then we made it through the first one. And I said, Mike, I'm thinking that one was a was was probably a, a bit of a surprise, right? He goes, Yeah, your first one's probably your your easier one. It's that second one where you have to do all the planning. I remember it. It's the second one where you have to do all the planning while the work's going, while you've got this change. You want, you know, you want me to stick around? I was like, you, you're darn tootin', I do. So, you know, that's when, when folk hear me talk about that trusted partnership, that conversation was never about Mike's bill rate. That conversation was, 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 you know, was never about, you know, anything other than, than Mike and I being a hundred percent in the game to see the transformation take place for a team of people who deserved it. There were hundreds of people running around, you know, in this Byzantine um, uh, hysteria riddled, you know, uh, quasi delivery model. And if you don't think that they were under a lot of stress and a lot of pressure trying to deliver where there is no framework, there's no clarity, there's no guardrails, who's passing to who? It was bigger than just moving delivery percentages or moving margins. We changed the culture. 
I had an attrition rate that was that was abysmal when I inherited it. It was huge because of the lack of framework, burning people out. So after we put this framework in there, I mean, my attrition rate dropped by double percentages. And I'm not talking 10. So, you know, we built one of the best uh, organizations, if you will, in, inside of IQB as a result of our shift of mindset, people, structure, delivery model, et cetera. But those were some of the stakes that, that we also had wrapped up wrapped up in there. So that would be my answer to that, Bill. Awesome. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. One of the things that, that, um, that the audience might be interested in is Mike's not working with you right now, right? So there's, what are your thoughts on, you know, how long does the consultant stay? Does the consultant stay for, you know, three months, six months, three years? You hear stories about people being at a, at a client for, you know, five, six years. Um, I, I know, and, and for the audience, just so you know, my role with the, with the Cuvia was helping getting it going and then being that advisor to Mike in the background. So most of my work was, was supporting Mike in the, in the background um, because didn't need two of us there because Mike, Mike absolutely um, was, was there on the forefront. But part of this was at what point do we, do, do they, they've got this and we can become a phone a friend. You know, it was, how, how long was it? It was about, how, do you remember how, how long it actually, the engagement was? I, uh, well, I think for me, for the part of the engagement that I was in, Mike, I'm going to call it October to February. Yeah, Am I about right? Sense. March? Yeah. About, about, um, so it, some, some days it felt like days, some days it felt like years, <laughs> you know. Some days it felt like, you know, I was giving reviews to the other part of my staff and I was calling Mike in to give him a, you know, mid-year review or whatever, but it went, it went, it did go by extraordinarily fast, but it, he's always been accessible. You know, I had questions around, um, you know, for instance, do I take somebody who really understood this safe framework extremely well that I actually have partnered up with Mike and do I I move her into a role where we kind of have a safe operations expert, if you will, burn down logs, you know, um, groomed back logs, velocity, program increment, uh, uh, statistics, et cetera. And, you know, I reached out to him and I asked him, hey, listen, I'm thinking about doing this. What, what, what are your thoughts? And, you know, he would give me back, back his thoughts. So it's a hard question to answer, Phil, but if you, if you, value the relationship that you built with somebody and you went through the things that that we went through and Mike Mike is spot on I told him a lot of personal things about my personal professional fears trepidations man I've never done anything this big my doubts and how important this was to me new to the company I have become the golden boy real quick I need this win like I shared these things with him you know along the way so that we bonded and I think that it kind of bonded Mike and I together in a way that kind of transcends, again, a consulting contracting. I look at Mike as someone who is in possession of a profound amount of knowledge and information that I and, and whose decision making I also trust. So I will reach out to Mike from time to time and, and, and solicit his feedback. And it's, um, it's but it's in terms of how long they stay. I think that's up to the to how the partnership is developed and how intentional those two people are. Mike and I saw an opportunity for the partnership between him and I to run from now to infinity. And we both looked it in the face and we said, no, four months, we're drawing a line in the sand. By January 1, you'll be running your first program increment. I barely believed the nonsense that we were that was coming out of our mouth. And in November or early part of December, we were already running our first program increment. So when when consultants run long, you also have to look at, at the change instrument with whom they're partnered with. How intentional are they? And then how have they come together to make an agreement, draw a line and send and hold each other accountable. It's so easy to say, oh, the consultant is there forever. Well, that also is a reflection of the business, right? That's the business is, is, is um, recognizing and accepting the fact that they have partnered that individual with somebody who cannot give that consultant probably the decision-making and outcomes that they need. So the, the business that houses a consultant long-term is as responsible, if not more, than the consulting firm. Mike can't make me make decisions, right? And, and, and Mike is not gonna you know, uh, 
cut bait and bail if if the work's not done, right? So if it takes me six months to make a decision that Mike's waiting on, is that his fault or mine? It's my fault. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were just very intentional about our timelines and our outcomes. And that's kind of where I was going, you know, is that there's that's that outcome, right? It's not a it's, it's a, it still has to be focused on what are what are our goals here, right? And the goal for and I remember from initial you know conversations was the goal is for you to be able to find a new way of working that you can sustain and improve on your own. And you know, you mentioned kind of Mike's more than a consultant, more than a coach. And you know, tying this back to the, the kind of the theme of the series here, and we'll open it up for questions in just a second. Is um, you know, there's there's a hat you'll wear called consulting, uh, called so called consultant, and that consultant hat is different than a coaching hat. And you know, in most scenarios, you need to wear multiple hats. You need to tap into mentoring skills, uh, tap into coaching skills, facilitation skills, training skills, all of those, and. Um, one last question for you, Mike, um, and, and Charles, you can absolutely give your advice here as well. But Mike, when you think about your own journey, right, and, you know, you went through the implementing safe class to become an SPC, you know, you've been through some training classes previously, lots of, of experience as an RT, one of the best RTs I've met. Um, what actually prepared you to be able to be a consultant and to be able to support Charles in this kind of partnership? And what advice do you have to SPCs that are earlier on their journey and they want to be a Mike. They want to, they, they want to have a have a Charles trusting them the way that, that Charles obviously trusts you. Well, I, I think it's if people have been listening, it, it's been evident, you know, that really all our success was based off of our combined ability as a partnership to build that relationship, to, to establish an environment of trust, to be vulnerable with each other. Um, and, and I'm getting goosebumps and the idea of really connecting with your client, if you're, if you're not able to do that, don't expect the magic to happen. Um, and it's hard to make yourself vulnerable, uh, you know, been there. Um, and, you know, to me, focusing on the values and the principles is really, if you make that part of, of the whole engagement, if everyone's embracing that, then you can tackle anything. Um, so to me, yes, it's great to understand how PI planning works. It's great to understand how a problem solving workshop works. It's great to understand what mean, you know, what agile and lean mean, but in the end, if you're able to, you know, that's part of the journey. If, but if you're able to establish early on those values and principles in a way that people really believe them and make them part of who they are, then you know, you're off to the races. It, there, there's there's no limit to your ability to be successful. Thanks, Mike. Anything you'd add, Charles? Be honest. You know, um, if I was in if I was in Mike's seat, I, and I was answering that question, I think that probably one of the most valuable attributes that he brought to the table was his honesty. And at times, it's easy to say some of these things. Oh, speak with confidence. Oh, be transparent. Oh, be honest. It's easy to say that, but that's hard to do. That's really, really hard to do, you know, is to admit that you don't know things, to admit that you're scared, to admit that you're confused, to admit that you need help. It rolls off the tongue so easy, these things we say. And then you find yourself in those situations and they're incredibly difficult. And I think like if, you know, if Mike and I weren't committed to being honest up to and including one of the exchanges, Phil, that, that you're referencing we said some hard things to each other in that call that was probably one of the hardest calls i've had because we were just cutting right through the bs and we were saying what well, we needed to be successful it was hard to swallow some of that stuff but we all acquiesced so i would say be honest with your client. You're doing them a disservice by just yesing them, by acquiescing to them, by you know um, supporting things that that are whimsical, by not raising things that are uncomfortable. Like Mike came in one time, said, "Man, you, you you're going to have to deal with some cultural issues." I was on a few, and he was spot on. And I had I had to you know I was listening to some things and da da, and he shared it with me, right? Um, but that level of honesty is not in everybody, but it was the number one thing I think that drove us because if you're honest, you're gonna 
You're going to say how you feel. It's going to be respectful. It's going to be well thought. It's going to be unemotional. It's going to be factual and empirical. And you're going to put it on the table. You're going to allow yourself to address it and move forward. So I would say that would be the biggest thing. The second thing I would, I would advocate for people who are in my seat, due diligence on the company that you're going to partner up with. What, what, what market space are they in? You know, what are they doing? You know, so that when you, when you assist in putting together the framework that we talked about earlier needs to flex, you understand um, kind of the paradigm within which delivery needs to transpire. You, there are certain things that you can do from a, from a, you know, agile or say framework in say, you know, maybe manufacturing roof shingles that you absolutely cannot never do in clinical trials where you're touching patient data and you've got audit trails and you've got this, you know, overly prescriptive validation type approach. So be very familiar about the company within which you're, you're about to partner up with and make sure you understand some of the inner workings of it. Those are probably the two biggest pieces of advice I could give. That's great advice. And, you know, this, this whole series, um, you know, the idea behind it is to help these, these SPCs on their journey and to help the individuals that may be hiring them, whether it be internal as a full-time employee or as a, as a, um, um, as a consultant or a coach, because um, there's more to it than just the knowledge of safe. Um, thank you so much. L Laura, do you have any questions from the audience or do you have any questions yourself? Um, yeah, actually, if anyone has questions, pop them into the Q&A for sure. But I do have one or two of my own. So Charles, thank you so much for, for doing this. Um, one of the, the things I was considering as you were talking is it seems like you had a lot of clarity around both the motivations for doing this and also the outcomes that you needed to achieve, right? You, you said to yourself, I need this win. My people deserve this win. Mm -hmm. And we're not meeting commitments and we have attrition problems. And so there's some really clear things, right? So I think that's like the foundation for a really clear relationship between a client and a customer or a consultant and a customer. What I'm wondering is how much runway did you have and how how were you building the runway in front of you as you were running down it? Because you're gonna need some short-term wins to keep right you have to like earn the right to keep going even though you're aligned on motivations and outcomes it's not like we had two years to get there right no it was it's probably it was probably 30 days at best you know i slid in in september in october i'm presenting to you know the president of the division how i feel that we're going to you know kind of shift the landscape of you know how we have been executing and you know spending $20 million a year. I mean, $20 million a year for an IT organization, that's that's bigger than most small businesses. You know, mm -hmm. definitely bigger than most small businesses. And that's medium-sized business. So I'm having to convince her that I'm going to take a $20 million business on the fly that's in flight and change it. The runway was 30 days. And um, her expectation was that by January 1, we provided that first program increment, which I, which I thought was insane. Um, but within six weeks, we 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 did it after we gained that clarity, you know, end of November, first part of December. So the runway was extremely short. So you you and I'm assuming then that you and Mike were always thinking about, OK, well, what are the good news stories? What are the evidence that we've been generating so far that says, hey, this is it, this has all indications that we're going in the right direction and that this is going to work. Did you have a conscious plan about what those things were and how you communicate them? The, well, the plan was fluid. It was agile, as Mike kind of referred to earlier. But it was, but there were, but there were signals along the way of, you know, what symptoms uh, were ailing, you know, um, the body, so to speak. Right? You just had to put it together. So some parts of that was, hey, listen, while we're building this out, let's think about how we retool our governance model because it's not just about the lack of del delivery; it's about the lack of connectivity. Presidents and senior VPs who are spending money have no idea what they're spending money. You, well, you can blame IT if you want, but you know, at some point in time, you got to take ownership of that too, right? So there were things like that that we would tease out and build along the way. Hey, let's put together a governance body based on the same on the safe framework or the agile framework, and then let's denote in the governance framework who would participate there, what would they be discussing, and then hey, let's do a mock up of what you know the reports would look like. So we did little things like that along the way as kind of teasers to let them know this is the type of insight 
and um, surgical management over their investments that they could anticipate seeing coming, you know, down the road. So, yeah, but we did not sit down in the beginning and say, hey, in a couple of weeks, let's do this. And in a couple more weeks, let's do that. Just along the way, we're like, oh, man, I could I have to give an update to the president. Let's take this. So I did give, you know, bi-monthly updates to the president. Um, but that's how we managed it. Yeah. OK. But then there, I have one other question I wanted to throw in there that's actually coming from the Q&A. So it was my other piece of the question. I know that one of the things that uh, we talk about at Applied Frameworks is to keep the framework flexible. And I think you mentioned that, Charles, in talking about it, which is, you know, you have a lot of opportunity to, to flex so that the framework meets you where you are along with the people that you're working with. So the question from Michael from the audience is, is there anything that in the safe framework that you either changed significantly or didn't adopt at all because it wasn't going to help you or, or are there things that you know are coming that you've delayed? Like how, when you say it was flexible to you, are there some specific things that you did or didn't do? Um, well, I'll tell you what we didn't do. We didn't compromise on the values and principles. Um, that was the bedrock of what we built off of. Um, and, you know, we talked about it through the discussion, but you really have to meet people where they are. Um, and it's okay. Like, you, you know, that's the first thing that, that um, clients really wrestle getting their heads around is, is it okay that we're in this position? Yes, it's okay. It's where you're starting from. There's no shame in that. Let's, you know, let's recognize it, understand your context, your challenges, and move on. Um, specifically with Akibia, I, I think, you know, compliance is a huge challenge for these guys. Um, Charles can speak to it better than I can. But when you're trying to release on demand and you have very rigid compliance, because you could be fined thousands, you know, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of dollars if you mess something up, it becomes a big issue. And trying to get flow to work um, and deployed while you know that compliance is, is you know not moving at the speed you would like it to is a challenge and that you know that's a, a point of reality now i know that compliance is starting to have discussions with these guys earlier on in their development cycle to to help make that um, a discussion throughout instead of something that they're inspecting in afterwards but you know um i, I think charles can add more to that but to me that no, i think it's I think it's spot on. The other thing that kind of, and this was a big one to be quite honest, was, you know, in the safe framework, all the boxes are nicely nestled under, you know, single management structure and single management line. When you got 10,000 people in an IT organization, this cross matrix, it doesn't, it doesn't look or feel like that. And so, you know, the whole change of like the roles down to the titles, BAs becoming product owners, so on and so forth, but then taking those resources and quarantining them off and putting them in a direct-to-patient stack, which is the technology stack I'm responsible for, that piece we were having to make some concessions because it did, because all the cross matrices with 52 managers sitting outside overlooking the 300 people that are actually building the product stack and decision-making and stuff, we had to make some concessions there to say, okay, we understand that this is the optimal, but for now, we're gonna have to adapt the framework to fit this cross matrix environment until we can get to, you know, how safe nicely has the boxes all put there. So we had to come up with a framework that allowed us to run um, untucked for lack of a better term or un unstructured for lack of a better term until um, maybe March, April. So we had to run like that for four or five months. So there was some puts and takes there with some of the activities because of the way that we were structured. We had to go sell other managers to let go of their resources, change reporting lines, change financial buckets, et cetera, to come into the, to the true safe structure. So that was probably one of the biggest ones that sticks out to me. Mm -hmm. So what I hear there is that, that organizing around value was something that you had to, it didn't make sense for you to adopt. Um, you know, this is something that, um, you know, on other talks we've, we've talked about, um, you still want to do a value stream identification. You want to understand your value streams. And, and Charles' team did that. But after doing that, they still realized that to get to that, it wasn't a toggle switch. It was a journey in itself. And that's that's what he's sharing here. We had another question in, uh, in, our, in our chat here. Um, what's next for, for the company now? What's next for, what's next for you, um, Charles? What's next for Acubia? Um, 
I, I think I kind of laid it out there, right? So now we're in a paradigm where literally uh, we're spending more time focused on, you know, go-to-market strategies for some of our key technologies, repositioning um, how we leverage some of our key technologies. Um, you know, the delivery conversation is still at the forefront of, of our discussions, but we kind of tuck it to the side. It's probably 10 or 15% of what we focus on rather than our whole day being dominated by it. We're building other partnerships within our tech stack um, because, again, we now are liberated to spend our time in a much more strategic manner uh, than we were before. But we have also made a very, very strong commitment to safe, not just within, to maturing safe, not just within my organization. We've made substantial investments in my organization to have safe folk, but across the broader organization, we're rolling out safe across the broader IQVIA uh, organization. Um, so we have, we used my uh, group as the test case that proved that we could do this at scale. And now we're rolling this out across the broader IQVIA. That's the plan. Awesome. Well, I, I, I thank you all so much. You know, this was an experiment on a format without slides. Um, I, my hypothesis is that, you know, stories from the field, from real people, as opposed to um, so always presenting slides and stuff might be valuable to you as an audience. If you have any feedback, you can send it, um, you know, send it my way, phil at appliedframeworks.com um, or, or send it to laura at appliedframeworks.com. And um, this this recording will be made available. You know, um, it is um, Charles. Just thank you so much for for joining. My pleasure. There's there's such a value in getting a perspective from other individuals, right? So, um, you know, my hope hope in the future is to get more um, more Charleses on here. Even though there's not, I haven't met, met that many in the last <laughs> couple of years, but um, uh, more individuals to share their perspective. And so um, upcoming upcoming versions of this will have, you know, I'm an SPC and I'm a trainer. I'm an SPC and I'm a facilitator. I'm an SPC and I'm a mentor. I'm an SPC and I lead a I lead a transformation. Um, you know, I'm an SPC and I'm 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 trying to do LPM. That that one I may end up moving up farther in my or moving it up closer to my in the top of the backlog there because it's becoming a hot topic. Speaking of that, have, 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 well, you know what? We're at our time box, so I'm actually going to save that question for offline. Is I'll, If I start talking about LPM, it won't be a five-minute conversation. So um, thank you so much. Thank you, um, audience, for, for attending. Thank you, Laura, for, for moderating this, and, and Mike, for being, for being a Mike. So uh, I, I just want to thank Charles personally for making the time to do this. Charles, it's been a pleasure, and thank you again for your time. Happy to share it. I hope it was of value. All right. Thank you so much. And we'll be sending the recording out in a day. So um, take care, everybody. Thanks for being here. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye folks. Thank you. Stop recording. Here.